okay, can everybody hear me? Yep. Are there, is there a midterm going on today or anything or just people are busy? There's a quiz today? Okay. Uh, it's, uh, people are very focused on tests. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, okay, so let's talk, we're gonna uh, finish talking about M4 today. I'll talk a little bit about parallelism. So something you could use for M4 on Thursday and we'll talk about that in the tutorial as well. Okay, so this week there is a coding tutorial again, it's the last one and uh, I recommend you go to it. It's gonna teach you the basics of parallelism in general. How do you multi-thread a program and how do you use that in Milestone 4 in particular. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is the last lecture on algorithms that you could apply for Milestone 4. Okay, so we've talked about uh, greedy algorithms, we've talked about iterative improvement algorithms, and I've been kind of drawing travel paths. So that's not what you want to do in your program, you can't draw travel paths and, and optimize that way, you need to represent it somehow in data. So how are we going to represent these data, these travel paths? Okay, so one option you have is basically use the exact data structure that we tell you you've got to use to return a solution to represent your solution all the time. Um, and so in the milestone four header, we describe this courier subpath uh, data structure. So a courier subpath is basically a starting intersection, an ending intersection, and a vector of street segments. So it's basically just what you did for milestone three. Go from this intersection to that intersection using these street segments. For this traveling courier problem, your solution needs a whole bunch of those in series in order to produce a full solution. So we say, okay, give us a vector of that, right? A bunch of those courier subpaths starting on a depot and ending on a depot and going through all the deliveries in a legal order. So that's what you gotta return in the end. So you eventually have to construct this. So you could use this to represent your solution as you're perturbing things, as you're trying different delivery orders. Um, any thoughts on if that's a good idea or a bad idea? What do you think? So could do it, it's perfectly feasible. Is there any downside to doing that? So what do you think? You want your perturbations to be fast. Okay, so if my perturbations are faster, I can do more of them. And that actually makes your algorithm better. One of the strengths of an iterative improvement algorithm is if it just tries lots and lots of ways to improve things. Uh, it doesn't have to think about, is this a really good idea or a bad idea in terms of improving the path, it just tries it. And so we'd like it to be fast. So yeah, let me just draw out what this means. So this courier subpath, let's say there's a certain intersection number 53 that was maybe a depot and I'm gonna start there, there's an ending intersection that is maybe my, a pickup, I'm gonna go there, that's intersection 28, and I have a bunch of street segments to get between them. So that's what a courier subpath looks like, should have animated that before. You need to make a vector of those for your final solution. So we could use that as our solution representation, and it basically looks like this, like the arrows are the street segments and the, um, points that the circles are the intersections. So I can turn this graphical view into that solution pretty easily. Okay, so I could represent it that way, but it's gonna slow down my perturbation algorithm. Like basically that representation is more information than I need when I'm just evaluating how do I swap, uh, like how do I perturb the order of deliveries and is that a good idea or not. So it would be better to store my solution in a more succinct form while I'm doing these perturbations and only at the end of my algorithm turn it into that full complete solution form that I need to return. Does that make sense? So it's not like one of these is right and one is wrong, but I would say a more compact representation that I can perturb faster is, is gonna be better if I wanna do iterative improvement. Okay, so how can I store this? So I guess I, uh, I'm gonna animate it in the solution again. So I showed you that the full solution basically encodes all of these arrows, all of these intersections. Uh, but for a delivery order, I could store it more succinctly. I could basically make a data type called pickup or drop off. 
So I can make a little struct that says, what am I? Am I a pickup? Am I a drop off? Am I a depot? So that's maybe the first member of my struct. And the second member could be what's my intersection ID. And then I could have a vector of those. And that would store what is my delivery order. Okay, so for this uh, particular solution, I'm basically doing the pickup zero first, drop off zero next, pick up one next, then pick up three and so on. And that's what I put in my delivery order. Pick up zero, drop off zero, pick up one, pick up three and so on. Um, does that make sense? So I, there's a few different ways I could store this. But one way I could store it is just a, a flag in my structure that says, are you a depot, a pickup or a drop off? And then some ID of which one are you? which if you look at how we pass a problem to you, we pass you a vector of pickups and drop-offs. So you could just use, well, what's your index in that vector, right? Which is kind of what I'm doing graphically here. And uh, the order in which you store those pickups, drop-offs and depots defines your delivery order. It doesn't say what's the travel path, like what are all the street segments I need to follow. It just says what is the order in which I should go to things. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, this one's not quite complete. I didn't put the depots in. So I really should uh, basically have the ability to represent a pickup, a drop off, or a depot. Again, I could like have a struct where I've just got a flag that can take three values to say which kind are you. Uh, and then I could have the index, your depot zero or your depot one, your pickup zero or your pickup three, et cetera. Um, so now here's a more complete delivery order. So I put the depots in, I start and end at depot zero, um, and I put all my pickups and drop offs in in order. So it's just gonna be easier to work with this, right? It's, it's a smaller representation, it's faster to perturb. Um, now I do need a way, now what I, if I use this representation, what I'm gonna wanna do is write a function that takes this representation and can quickly compute its travel time. Okay, because this, this doesn't tell me if it's good or bad. But I could take this and using the data structure we talked about last time, like that matrix of what's the travel time between various interesting intersections, I could write a function that takes a delivery order and looks up in, in that matrix or maybe in an unordered map, like this table of pre-computed delays between interesting intersections and returns the travel time. And that's a good thing to have if I want to do iterative improvement, because now if I make a new delivery order, I can very quickly check what is travel time. I'd probably want to make another function that checks if it's a legal delivery order. Given those functions, I can quickly check is this a good perturbation or not. Okay, so here's a, a picture without the, the map in the background of one of my delivery orders. Okay, so I started this, this depot, and let's say this was depot two. I don't think I labeled it. Um, and I started at it and I went to pick up one, then pick up three, pick up two, drop off one, drop off three. And I don't need to draw this whole picture. Um, I can represent that with this vector, right? So depot two, pick up one, drop off, or pick up three, pick up two, drop off one, and so on. And I eventually end up at depot two. So this delivery order encodes very succinctly, uh, what order am I gonna do things in? Um, it doesn't have the travel time, so that's why I'm saying you wanna write a function that given a de delivery order can quickly give you a travel time. So for this particular delivery order, if you go through and follow all these edges and the uh, marks on them, it's a total travel time of 93 minutes. Okay, so maybe I wanna make a change. Uh, and the change I wanna look at is a maybe the, the simplest, most local perturbation that I could make, which is I wanna change, I wanna move one pickup or one drop off. So I'm just gonna take one entry in this delivery order and I'm gonna move it somewhere else. And let's see, which one did I do actually? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this entry one, okay, which is here, and I wanna move it to the end of my delivery order. See if that's a good idea. Okay, so that's what I've done here. I took this one and I changed the delivery order by just moving it to the end of the vector. And now I'm gonna animate, well, what does that mean? So right now I'm, I'm going around this travel path and I go from pickup two 
uh, to drop off one, okay? Once I change this order by moving this to the end, that's not what I'm doing, right? So these, these edges I just deleted, they're not part of my delivery order anymore. Instead, I go from pick up two to uh, drop off three. So I go to that spot, then I go follow the rest of this path, and at the very end, where I'm at drop off two, I go to drop off one, and then I go back to the final depot. Okay, so I go over there. Um, okay, so does that make sense? So this delivery order encodes this picture. Uh, and I wanna see what is the new travel time. And let's see if I have it in here. Yeah, so it was 93, if I actually add all this up, it's actually worse. Okay, so travel time is 99 minutes with this change, so I don't wanna keep it. Lots of, most of the perturbations you try on a delivery order, once it's reasonably optimized, will actually be bad. So I take this delivery order, I feed it to my routine that says what's the travel time of this, and it says it's higher, it's 99 minutes, so I'm actually gonna throw it away. So I'm gonna revert back to this older delivery order. Okay, so that was one perturbation, just moving, right, I moved one of the items in my delivery order to a different spot. How do I pick what to move? Well, if your, your routine that checks um, what the travel time is is pretty fast, and I should also check this is legal, so I need to check that all of the pickups occur before the corresponding drop off so I make a, write a routine for that. If both those routines are fast, I can do this for a lot of delivery orders. So I might basically try moving every single um, item, every single pickup or drop off in my delivery order to every other possible place. So I might do that, and if that's, if I don't run out of CPU time, I might do that and I might do it several times, right? Because after I change something, maybe going back and trying it again, going through that whole list of possibilities again is a good idea. So that's one way I can do it. I can just try all the perturbations and as long as my code's fast enough, that's fine. If I accept any perturbation, going back and trying again is a good idea because something's changed so maybe now some new opportunities came up. If it turns out that I, that that's too time consuming, I'm running out of time uh, to go through all the possibilities, you can generate random numbers in a program. So if you look in the C++ library, you're gonna find that there are a bunch of random number generation routines. So I could randomly pick a number between, you know, in this vector that's encoding my delivery order. So I pick one number, what is the starting, the thing I'm gonna move, and then I can pick another number, where am I gonna move it to? Okay, so that's a technique I could use if I can't just try everything. That takes too long, but I, I wanna kind of randomly try a lot of stuff. The faster my recompute the travel time and check if this is legal functions are, the more perturbations I can run. And that tends to help me get better answers. Okay, so does that make sense, everybody? Um, okay, so, but that's not the only perturbation operator I could have. That's kind of the, maybe the simplest one, makes the smallest changes, which has some advantages, you know, less likely to be illegal, and uh, maybe more likely to get small changes, like positive changes in travel time, so more likely that we find something that's good. But as I showed last week, you can also get stuck, where those small perturbations might never get you to a better solution. So we could do something a little more, uh, a bit bigger perturbation, we could swap the order of two deliveries. So what does that look like? So let's say I decide I wanna swap the order of this pickup, or sorry, drop off two and drop off zero. So right now I go through my travel path like this, right, in this sequence, and then drop it off back at the, uh, back at the depot. So I wanna evaluate swapping those, these two items, okay, this one and this one. What if we just swap those two? Um, so, pictorially, if I do that, my travel path, I have to reconstruct it here, it looks like this. Okay, so I've changed my delivery order some, and that changes some of the travel times on the edges, and if I add all that up, uh, the travel time's actually better. Okay, so it's, uh, this is where I've made my change, and the travel time drops to 77 minutes, which is better, so this one I'd like to keep. 
Okay, so that makes sense? So again, the code to make the perturbation is pretty simple. And having a function that quickly checks, is this legal? And what is the travel time? Is a good way to architect an iterative improvement algorithm because you've kind of separated out what's proposing the, per the perturbations from something that checks if it's legal and checks if it's a good idea. Kind of makes your code more modular, lets you try different ideas for what might be good perturbations quickly. Okay, so we also talked about a more powerful perturbation operator still, like something that's more disruptive, can get you to uh, out of local minima, can get you to a different part of the search space called 2-opt. Okay, so remember 2-opt, uh, and here I forgot to put the depots in, so I guess there should be a 2 and 2 for the depots at the start and the end of this, if I number this as depot 2. So if I take this delivery order, what does a 2-opt mean? Well, 2-opt means delete two of the connections in the path. So which two? Well, I could pick them randomly. That's a reasonable thing to do. If my code's fast enough, I could say, well, I'll try all possible edges, pairs of edges that I could delete, which is a fair number. Um, but you could try them all if your code's fast enough. Otherwise, you could do it randomly. So let's say I pick uh, these two edges to delete. Okay, so they've now disappeared. And I've drawn bars where I just deleted edges. Because what 2-op does is it actually divides your travel path into three pieces. So those bars are the three pieces I just divided it into. And that kind of gives you an idea of, well, how might you do this, say, randomly? You know, pick a spot where, two spots where you're gonna cut the path. So generate a couple random numbers. I now need to reconnect them differently. If I just reconnect them in the same way, I get the same thing. So how can I reconnect these differently? Well, basically I can take these three pieces and I can reorder the three pieces. I can also choose to reverse any of the three pieces. Those are basically the ways I can reconnect these. So I'm gonna reconnect these pieces in a different order. Uh, I'm gonna connect basically, uh, well actually what I did in that case was I, I kept the order of the three pieces the same but I reversed the order of the one in the middle. So that's what I just drew. Uh, so in general for 2-opt, you pick your two cut points, uh, then you pick, okay, those three subpaths, what order do I want to put them in? I can change their order. And then you can choose to reverse any of the subpaths or not. And all those things have a potential, significant potential to make your uh, travel path illegal because we need our pickups to be before our drop-offs. So you have to check if it's illegal at the end of that because there's a pretty good chance that it is illegal. And we talked about this at the end of last week, but basically maybe making smaller cuts, like taking, making one of those three pieces smaller and just reversing it. Maybe that's a less disruptive thing that's got more chance of being legal. So you might choose which two ops you, you, you try to do to be more likely to be legal. If you divide a long path into three equal pieces and then just reorder the pieces, given the constraint of a pickup before a drop off, that's almost certainly gonna be illegal. So it might be kind of a waste of your CPU time. Uh, you also, okay, so you can easily write a legality checking routine. Basically it just means your pickups come before your drop offs. You could write a routine that actually tries to legalize. So it doesn't just, you check if it's legal, if it's not, you try to fix it. And trying to fix it basically means you gotta find the pickups, well the drop offs that come before their pickoffs and, and you gotta move them after their, uh, their pickup. So that's a technique that you could use to re-legalize a path. If it disrupts the order a lot, then it's probably gonna result in a bad travel path. Right? If you've got a pretty optimized travel path and you start perturbing it in really big ways, it's probably not gonna work very well. But if it doesn't perturb it too much, then that re-legalization is, is helpful, right? You might be able to make some larger perturbations, make them legal, and get some good solutions. Okay, does that make sense? So that's kind of how would I recommend you represent the solution and actually implement perturbations. Okay, so let me give you an overview of the heuristics we've talked about so far. So the space that you're actually looking at, for the big travel problems we give you, you've got maybe 200 intersections that you've got to go between. So the, that actually means that your solution space is like 200 dimensional. You know, which one do you go first to? So I can't draw a 200 dimensional space. I'm actually not even very good at 3D drawing, so I'm not gonna try 200 dimensional. So this is like a one dimensional space. So we'll just pretend the solution can be laid out in one dimension. 
And at every solution, we got a travel time. And higher is worse. So um, we have what are called local minima in the cost space. So a local minima is basically any spot where a small perturbation is going to make things worse, okay? And we have, you know, one global minimum. So global minimums across this huge possible solution space, that is the absolute best one. And that's gonna be very hard to find. Okay, so let's say we pick a random order. Uh, that's the simplest thing. We just take the order we give you or just pick one at random. Uh, how, where do you think it's gonna be on this cost space? It's gonna be towards the top, gonna be towards the bottom, gonna be in the middle, what do you think? This is like maybe an unanswerable question, but you can just take a shot at it. So what do you think? You pick a random one, do you feel lucky? Do you feel it's gonna be there? Do you feel it's gonna be somewhere in the middle? Do you feel it's gonna be up near the top? What do you think? Somebody's gotta have a guess. I mean, even just divided into three pieces, it's almost binary. You got like a 33% chance. And it doesn't even have a perfect, there's no, I'm not proving anything, so there's no really right answer to this. So how many people think if I pick one at random, I'm gonna probably be near the global minimum? Okay, so nobody believes that. So you're actually gonna to tend to be pretty high in the cost space because there's basically many more bad solutions than good ones. So you probably won't be the absolute worst solution unless you're really unlucky, but you're not actually gonna be close, you're very unlikely to be close to one of these pretty good solutions because while well, this doesn't show up so much maybe on, in one dimensions, when you see a 200 dimensional search space, there's just way more stuff up here in the bad spots than there are down deep in the minima. So a random order is not gonna be very good. Um, so we wanna, and a random order is just say, take the delivery order we give you and just call your find path for milestone three and return it. So it's gonna be a pretty bad solution. So, now we could do a bit better by picking several random solutions, right? That's multi-start. We'll just, okay, you give us, you pick the solutions randomly using the random number generators in C++. Okay, so you get a bunch of answers and you'll pick the best one. Okay, so it's a bit better. It's still not gonna be very good because there are so many bad solutions compared to, uh, you know, the number of pretty good solutions. But it's better than just picking the first random order. Okay, so greedy algorithm. What a greedy algorithm does is it basically is pretty good at getting to local minima. Okay, so we start out um, making decisions, uh, you know, one at a time, and we'll generally get a pretty good, pretty good solution from a greedy algorithm for this problem. Much, much better than random. Okay, uh, it isn't all the way in a local optima. What I mean, what that means is we made some decisions in our greedy algorithms without perfect information. Like we didn't even know what the whole solution was yet. We just said go to the next legal, in, closest legal intersection. And once we have a greedy solution, if we, if we iteratively improve it, like we basically start trying to do perturbations on it, we can usually find some improvements. So most of the perturbations that we propose, like let's move this delivery, let's move this, um, pick up or drop off to a different spot in the delivery order, most of that's actually gonna be a bad idea. But if we can try a lot, we will find some good ones, and whenever we find a good one, we update our solution, and then we keep looking. We look for more uh, perturbations, and we keep going. And that can actually get us to a local minimum. Um, it goes to a local minimum, and it will get, it'll get stuck there. Right, so our perturbation operator, we've gotten to a pretty good spot and now any perturbation we try is not any good, is not any better. We can combine, so, so far we've actually combined greedy with iterative improvement to get to this point. Uh, we can combine this with multi-start. So we looked at what are techniques by which we could change our greedy algorithm to get a better, uh, a different answer. So we, we run our greedy algorithm, we run iterative improvement, we get to this spot. Now we just run our greedy algorithm again, and we use one of those techniques that uh, we came up with to just make it get a different answer. Now start at a different depot, for example. Okay, so by doing that, it just starts in a completely different spot. And then we run iterative improvement again, and we get to that local minimum. We do another multi-start, iterative improvement, we get there, um, and so on. 
So, Multistar can help us here, right? We, we're not that great out of getting out of local minima so far, but Multistar just moves us to completely different spots in the cost space. And if we take the best one of those, we tend to get a better answer. And there's not much more code. Okay, so I already showed you this. Local permutations can get stuck. So they, they go down until they can't find anything useful to do. So that is the definition of a local minima. Right, so this local, uh, this local minima we can't get out of with a certain permutation operator. Maybe changing, taking one pickup or drop off and moving it to a different spot. We can't find anything that we would do that would make it better. Uh, but if we change our permutation operator, so let's say, let's say that wasn't our only permutation operator. Let's say we built a few. We also built one that could swap two deliveries. We built another one that could do two opt. Maybe we come up with some clever ones that are our own special sauce. Uh, what happens with, if you have multiple permutation operators and some of them are able to uh, make bigger changes, like two opts, is you're less prone to getting stuck in a local minimum, okay? So maybe I uh, started, I was in this yellow spot and a bigger permutation operator can basically make a big enough change that it gets all the way in one step from there to there. Okay, which happens the way I've drawn it to be a little bit lower cost. So I kind of jumped over a local maximum. And now I can make little perturbations and I can follow it all the way down to a better local minimum. Okay, so more, having a, a, a several permutation operators or having more powerful permutation operators makes you less prone to getting stuck. Um, however, it also consumes more CPU time. Right? So you have to be careful if you have, you need to make your permutation operators fast. And if your permutations get too disruptive, you know, at some point they start turning into just making random solutions because they've pretty much completely destroyed your initial solution. So there's kind of a balance here. Um, the absolute best solutions usually just combine several permutation operators because there is actually no one permutation operator that's just the best. Okay. Um, there's another technique that I'm going to show in a minute called hill climbing. Okay, so what hill climbing does is so far the permutation, or the iterative improvement that I've shown you is always try to change the solution, check the travel time, if it's better, update, if it's not better, don't update. Okay, and that's a very reasonable way to do things. But it does get stuck in local minima. So I can do uh, something called hill climbing where basically I've gone from the yellow solution to the red one, it's worse. The travel time's higher, but I'm gonna keep going anyway. I'm gonna see where does this lead. Okay, so, and I make another permutation and that's worse still. But I haven't given up yet. Um, and now I make another permutation and things start getting better. And as I make a bunch of permutations, uh, I actually find a better minimum. And for illustrative purposes, this one I showed just getting the global minimum, so it's fantastic. So hill climbing lets you explore more of the solution space because you don't give up right away. You keep going and see if future permutations can get you to a better spot. So this can get you unstuck from local minima. Um, you have to watch your CPU time with it because hill climbing is useful if you're getting stuck a lot. It can let you explore more of the solution space, but you don't, I wouldn't want to have done some hill climbing, wound up here and then run out of CPU time because now I basically, I burnt my CPU time just making the solution worse uh, and, uh, and I return a worse solution. It's a good idea if you do hill climbing to actually also store the best solution you've ever seen. Because now if CPU time's about to run out, you go, let's go back to that one. This, this hill climbing hasn't worked out for me, let's go back to something that works well. Um, okay, so this hill climbing was the last heuristic then. This is the fourth heuristic. It's one way to get out of a rut. I'm kind of stuck, any little change I make is not good. So I'm gonna change something even if it looks like a bad idea at first. Um, so in our problem that would be changing the delivery order and even if it increases the travel time, we're just gonna stick with it for a while. We're gonna try local perturbations around that new solution. If we find something better, we keep going. As I said, it's a good idea to keep the best solution you ever had so that if you find this is just getting worse and worse, uh, you can always go back to that earlier solution. Okay, so there's a, 
what's called a meta heuristic called simulated annealing. So a meta heuristic means it's kind of like a, a pretty general idea. It's actually less specific than an exact algorithm that you can apply to one problem. It's basically a procedure that you can turn into an algorithm for all sorts of different problems, okay? So that's what simulated annealing is. It's called a meta heuristic. Um, it, it is an organized way to do hill climbing when you're searching for a good solution to these computationally hard problems. So it, it comes from an analogy to annealing metals. So if you're trying to, now, so I've never actually done this, but if you're trying to make a strong metal, uh, it's a bad idea to cool it really slow, fast, okay? So you heat it up so you can forge, I don't know, a sword. Uh, and if you cool that metal really quickly by what's called quenching, you take a red hot piece of iron and you stick it in the barrel of water, it cools really fast and the atoms basically can't move anymore. So whatever state they're in, they just freeze there. That metal will have more flaws. It's at a higher energy state, it will be more brittle. So people figured this out a long time ago. If you actually gradually cool down metals, you can actually make them stronger. And what you're doing is you're giving more time for the atoms to organize themselves into a, a lower energy state, like a better lattice basically with fewer imperfections, uh, and you get a stronger metal. Okay, so simulated annealing uh, mimics this in code. So you start with a poor initial solution, it doesn't have to be it could be random, it could be as bad as it's a random solution, but it doesn't have to be. It could be better than that, it could be the output of a greedy solution, for example. Um, but it's not great. And you start with some starting temperature. And you perturb the solution, so those perturbations are called moves, because it's like you're moving atoms. You're changing the solution. Um, and when the temperature is high, so the start of the algorithm, you accept most perturbations, um, even if they're bad. Okay, so it means you can change things pretty easily. It's like a red hot piece of metal. The atoms are moving a lot. Over time, you're decreasing in code this temperature parameter. And as the temperature decreases, it becomes increasingly unlikely that perturbations or moves that increase the cost or travel time significantly are, ex are accepted. So you're, that's, that's the annealing part. You're gradually cooling down the metal or the solution and you're not accepting changes that, uh, that make things worse. You're forcing the atoms to slowly find a better, uh, lower energy state. Okay, so what does that look like in code? Uh, so you have some initial solution, I'm gonna call that S, so that's like my delivery order. And maybe it's a random order, uh, but it could also be better. I could basically say maybe I'll use a greedy algorithm because they work pretty well and that'll be my initial solution. It's probably a better idea given that we're only giving you 50 seconds. I would say it's smarter to get, we have given you pretty good ideas about how to have an algorithm that gets a, uh, a reasonable answer, so that's probably a better starting point than random. We compute the cost of that solution. And for our problem, a natural cost would be travel time, right? The higher it is, the less we like it. Uh, and we have this parameter T, and we set it to be a high temperature initially, so a big number. Uh, and then the annealing process itself is basically while the solution is changing, um, and for many perturbations, so we're gonna do a whole bunch of moves here, lots. Uh, we're gonna basically say, let's create a new travel order, call that S new, and we get that by perturbing S. So maybe we move one delivery order, maybe we swap to any one of those things. Um, we then calculate what is the cost, probably is travel time for us, of that new, uh, of that new state. Oops, this should be S new, sorry about that. Uh, and then we calculate what's the cost difference. Okay, so what's the travel time of the new solution minus the travel time of the old solution, call that delta C. If delta C is less than zero, then we basically update our state. We say let's take that new delivery order and we, we now have a new travel time, a new cost. Okay, what I've shown you so far is just iterative improvement. Like there's nothing annealing about this. The annealing part is just what's in red. So we basically, if we've made things better, the travel time is better, we always accept it, we update. 
But there's some chance, even if we've made the travel time worse or the cost worse, that we do it anyway. We update the solution. So we get it, we ask for a random number between zero and one, and we compare that to uh, this function, exponential of the negative delta C divided by the temperature. Okay, so delta C is how much, how much has the travel time changed? Um, and we're only, we only care about this if it's gotten worse. So travel time got worse, we divide that by this temperature, and then we take a negative exponential of that. And so this number is always gonna be between zero and one. Uh, if the cost has gotten a lot worse, then this number is gonna be close to zero. And our odds of a random number we choose between zero and one being less than is very small. So there's not much chance that we'll accept the move. On the other hand, if this cost change was just a small degradation, maybe it's a few seconds longer travel time and maybe our temperature is quite high, then this negative exponential is gonna be pretty close to one and we got a pretty good chance of updating our solution anyway. And that's to explore more solutions. Okay, so this extra thing here is what makes this simulated annealing instead of just iterative improvement. Okay, so for this to converge, we need to every once in a while reduce the temperature. So every time we go through this while loop, we do a whole bunch of perturbations and then we reduce the temperature and we keep going until either the temp, you know, basically the solution is not changing or uh, we've run out of CPU time. Okay, so does that make sense? So pretty close to iterative improvement. Uh, okay, so let me show you to see if some intuition about this. Let's just put in a few delta Cs, so travel time changes from our perturbation and a few different temperatures. Uh, where are we in this anneal? And what's our probability of updating our solution? Okay, so if we get a negative cost change, like we've got a better solution, we always update it. If we made the travel time 30 seconds worse and our temperature was currently 30, we still actually got a 37% chance of updating. On the other hand, if, our, if we made the, temp, the travel time 30 seconds worse and is later than the anneal, you know, the temperature's dropped to 10, okay, now we've only got a 5% chance of updating it. And if it's even later in the anneal, that th same 30 seconds travel time increase when the temperature is three, we've got like less than a point, you know, 0.005% chance, so almost no chance. On the other hand, a small travel time change, say three seconds, uh, at that point in the anneal where T is three, we actually still have a reasonable chance of, of accepting, 37%. So this is why it's called simulated annealing. Initially, when this temperature is high, you'll accept you know, big changes even if they don't look very good. As the temperature drops, those big changes will not, are very unlikely to be accepted if they're bad, but small changes could be accepted even if they're bad. And then as the temperature gets smaller and uh, lower and lower, even those small changes, if they're bad, are unlikely to be accepted. Does this make sense? Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of tuning in an algorithm like this. So for, we talked about initial solution, should that be random or should it be smarter? Hint, smarter is probably better when you have a fixed, when you have a tight CPU time limit like you guys have. Um, the cost, travel time's a pretty natural one. You could add other things. Maybe it's kind of beneficial to have pickups earlier in your delivery order because it makes it easier to perturb and get legal solutions. So maybe you factor that into your cost function as well. Uh, or maybe that's not a good thing to put in the cost function. I said high temperature. Well, how high is that? Are you gonna do experiments to try to figure out how high it is? Um, are you gonna try a bunch of perturbations and see how big the changes are and maybe automatically compute what's a pretty high temperature? There's a bit of trickiness to, to getting this. Um, perturbations is a big one, okay? So what perturbations should I have? Uh, as the temperature drops, should I try to make smaller perturbations? Because big ones probably won't be accepted anyway. Uh, how quickly should I reduce the temperature? Um, and this kind of algorithm, because it benefits from being able to do a lot of perturbations, you would want to try to make these very fast. Okay, so you'd wanna write nice code that does the minimum work that it can. If these functions aren't that fast, simulated annealing is probably not a very good idea. Basically, if you can't do enough perturbations, uh, iterative improvement is gonna work better, where you just say, I'm not gonna do any hill climbing, because look, I don't have enough time. 
right? I, I can't evaluate enough perturbations, I can't waste my time exploring more of the space. As these become fast, uh, then simulated annealing can be beneficial. But it does take a fair amount of tuning, so I definitely would not, you don't have to do this for milestone uh, four to get a, a good solution. Um, it can be helpful, I would not do it to start with, right? Get something working first. Okay, so if this stuff, talk about algorithms has interested you, so how do you learn more about it? Um, for optimal algorithms, so Dijkstra, A-star, those are examples of optimal algorithms. We didn't prove why they worked, I just gave examples. If you wanna learn how to prove those actual exact algorithms, get the best answer and other ones, take EC345, Data Structures and Algorithms. Uh, it's, it's a useful complement to this course, there's no coding but all proofs, okay? So we gloss over the proofs, you're gonna do it, but you won't code it, but it is useful to know how to code it, so that's why we code them here. Um, heuristic algorithms for computationally hard problems. So milestone four, there's no perfect solution. So for that, we have basically grad courses. We don't actually have an undergrad course that goes deeper into these kinds of complicated algorithms, uh, but there's a course taught by Professor Anderson that is all about CAD algorithms for making integrated circuits and those are computationally hard and they use some of these procedures that we just talked about and some other ones. There's also another course on basically solving transportation problems um, and it's like algorithms to optimize traffic and cities and they actually use OSM data so you actually are would definitely hit the ground running in this course. And it looks at algorithms like simulated annealing, which we just talked about. Other meta heuristics like genetic algorithms. So genetic algorithms are another framework that you can put many problems in and they're inspired by natural selection. I'm not gonna talk about them because they're actually harder to make work for this problem. Not impossible, but harder. Um, but if you are interested, you'd learn more in that course. Okay, so a few practical things about Milestone 4. Um, we're giving you a 50 second time limit. So you can get better results with more CPU time. Uh, how can you get better results with more CPU time? Well, you can use multi-start. If you still have time left, you can just run my algorithm again with a different starting point. Keep the best answer. Uh, iterative improvement, you can just keep perturbing, right? To see if you find more perturbations that help you. Um, we give you problems of different sizes in different cities, so it can be hard for you to work out, well, how many times should I do multi-start? How many iterative improvements should I do so that I do, you know, kind of search as much as I can, but I never go over this 50 seconds. Because you have to return a set solution in less than 50 seconds or you just time out and you fail the test, which is bad. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? The best way to do it is actually ask the computer how much time has passed, rather than trying to like hard code a whole bunch of numbers. So to do that, we're gonna use the chrono library again. So I'm just gonna show you some code that's helpful for this. So we include chrono, uh, you shouldn't have magic numbers, so the time limit we give you is 50 seconds, but don't refer to 50, make a, make a, a variable or a constant. Okay, so in my main pro, I shouldn't actually put my optimization in main, but let's say I did, right? I can call chrono using this line to get what's the time right now. Uh, I can say I'm not out of time yet. And as long as I have more time, I'm gonna call my optimizer. Maybe this is doing iterative improvement, maybe it's doing multi-start, I don't know. But I'm gonna call it to, to keep making my solutions better. And every time it comes, every once in a while, whenever I come back from my optimizer, I'm gonna ask what time is it now? Uh, and I'm gonna, con I'm gonna basically take my starting time, or my current time minus my start time, do a bit of chrono magic casting, and basically I can check this is my time in seconds. So I'm giving you this code so you can just kind of use it. Uh, and I'm gonna basically say as long as, well, as soon as that gets to be more than 90% of my time limit, I'm done, okay? So I'm gonna say the timeout is true, which means I'm gonna fall out of this while loop and I'm gonna return my solution, okay? I wouldn't go all the way to 50 seconds, you can go pretty close, but leave yourself a little bit of margin because if your code still needs a little bit of, okay, set up the final delivery uh, data structures, like that, that vector of courier subpaths and return it, and our test needs to check and make sure it's legal, you wanna leave a little bit of time for that, okay? So a second or two anyway. Uh, okay, so this bit of code allows you to now adapt. Right, you will basically make full use of your CPU time, but you won't run out on, on any problem. So it's a good technique to, to tackle problems like this. 
Uh, does that make sense? This time, by the way, is called wall clock time. That's why I named the variable wall clock. Wall clock time is, you know, is like real time. Like it's what you would get if you look at your watch. Um, I'm gonna show you in the tutorial this week how to use multiple cores uh, in the UG machines if you wish. So your wall clock time is not gonna be the same as your CPU time. Because the CPU time, if you ask a program how much CPU time have you used, it adds up all the cores. You don't care, okay? If you manage to use more cores, you don't, you know, you might have eight times as much CPU time as wall clock time, but we don't care. So the calls I'm showing you here are like how much real time has elapsed. As long as that's less than 50 seconds when you return the solution, you're fine. Okay, so how are you gonna be graded? So 25% um, of your mark is gonna come from making a stable solution so you actually solve all the problems we give you at, so you don't crash, you return a legal solution. Uh, it includes quarter cases, so you, if you read the header file for m4.h, you will see that it defines at least one corner case. If we went to the trouble of carefully writing out that corner case, you can guess that we probably have a test for it, okay? So read the header file, make sure you work for that corner case. Uh, also make sure your valve grind clean. So that's in the unit tests. If you do EC297 exercise, um, we're, if you're not valve grind clean, your program's gonna be unstable, so it's really risky, but we'll also deduct some marks uh, up to 10% penalty if you're not valve grind clean. Okay, so it's not that hard to get legal solutions for this problem, so most of your mark is gonna come from uh, your quality. So we give you some small test cases, some bigger ones, and some what we call hard and extreme, which are the biggest test cases. And we're gonna, geometrically average your travel time on those hard and extreme test cases. We basically give you half of them. The other half are private. The private ones are no harder. Like they're basically just make sure that you haven't like gone off and hard coded the answer. Um, and based on how well you do on that, that'll affect your quality mark. I'm gonna show you in a second exactly how. There's also, if you like games, right, you can, compete to be one of the top four teams. Top four teams will get bonus marks. So 1% uh, to 4%, so top team gets 4%, fourth team gets 1%. So which on the total course mark, which means on this milestone, that's like plus eight to plus 33. Uh, and you get bragging rights and so on, and you can list it on your CV if you like. Uh, but it's not competitive beyond that, right? Uh, because we're gonna benchmark your quality versus reference solutions that we have. If every person in the class beats our reference solutions, then you're all gonna get a really good mark on it and I just have to explain it to the undergrad assessment committee. So, okay. So, the leaderboard we're about to put up. Uh, whenever you submit your solution, we will calculate your QOR on those big public test cases and we'll put you in the leaderboard. You will be anonymized, okay? So we're gonna post on your, on your wiki, like we will send you, actually I think we emailed this to you, we, we will send you what is your anonymous ID. So you know who you are on the leaderboard, nobody else does, just in case you are like shy. Um, and we are gonna put three solutions on the leaderboard, TA good, TA moderate, and TA bad. Okay, and I'll, TA bad is actually a random delivery order. Okay, so it's pretty bad. TA moderate is basically greedy solutions that are pretty reasonable. Okay, uh, mixed, uh, and TA good, we're actually using perturbation and kind of our best techniques, okay? If you, if you match TA good and you're stable, then you'll get 95% on the milestone. If you match TA moderate, which isn't that hard, you'll get 75%, and if you match TA bad, you get 30%. We've, we always get a question of like, what if you're almost at one? Like we fit a curve in between these. So if you're just a little better than TA moderate, you'll get a little bit better mark than TA moderate. But there are no cliff functions here. Every little bit of improvement, you will get a little bit better grade. Um, and there's a detailed rubric for Milestone 4 that kind of lays this out. So, yeah, so for more details on this, you can go look at the rubric, but basically if you get 5% better quality of results than TA good, you're at 100%, as long as you're stable. So make sure you don't crash, you don't have any valve grind errors, you've read the uh, corner cases because we are gonna check the corner cases. Any questions on any of that? Okay, 
Uh, so good luck. Oh, actually, I'll say one last thing on Mouse and 4. Another question I get is like, well, how can you 